uh, structure for you uh, much, but I do want you to know, uh, and you either pointer notes on that, as to you know, what the organelles are, what's the cell membrane made of? Uh, all the cell membranes made out of. Um, you know, what is the definition of an organelle and what are the organelles present in the cell? On the first worksheet, I'm going to have you draw a cell. Uh, you will not need to do that in class tomorrow, but but you can do that from any resource that you manage to do it from. And and so um, so that's uh, what you need to do. The internet search. Um, so as I mentioned yesterday, or Monday, um, I want you to um, use the form that is uh, in Blackboard to do an internet search um, looking up three key words. Histology, histopathology, and histotechnics. And as you'll see on that form, there are six boxes. And the first uh, row or column of boxes, uh, I want you to search using um, Google, google.com, and put uh, each of those keywords in Google. And then to go to a page, you know, at the bottom, you have the numbers for different uh, pages of the search. And I want you to click on one that's not number one, so it can be any one you choose. And then look on that page for that keyword and go to an interesting word page, a web page. And um, provide in that box the URL, Universal Resource Locator, HTTP, and then write two sentences, two complete sentences about that resource. So again, Google's going to give you a variety of resources, maybe, maybe books, maybe uh, web pages, maybe. Um, places where they compile lots of things together. Um, who knows what <laughs> you're going to get out of that. Um, but that's what I want you to find for that first column of boxes. And be sure to put the, the Google page that you use um, uh, you know, uh, at the top of the page. You can do all the same page for all three keywords. Or you can find a different page for different keywords as long as you can get it. Then, for the um, uh, right hand column, that's going to be a scholar.google.com uh, search. Do you all you know about scholar? Google Scholar? So, um, put that in and type in each of the keywords. Again, choose a, a page besides page one um, in, the, uh, in the search fields, uh, and and then provide one of the journal articles or books that pops up in that uh, thing. And then, following directions, you will note that I'm asking for different information there. I'm asking you to provide the title of the article um, and then um, the, um, what else am I asking for? Volume and, no, not volume, the, uh, the, the journal it's found in. Keywords. And, all, and this form is under the research paper. So, for, for the 
legal scholar, I need the title of the paper, title of the journal, and keywords, if you find them available. So when you go to the link for that particular article, um, often after the abstract, you'll see a list of keywords. And uh, if there are no keywords present, just say keywords not available. Okay. Um, and do that for each of those keywords. So, uh, so remember, I'm asking for different information for both of those things. Um, So I would, you know, print this out. I'd prefer that you just uh, uh, wrote on it by hand. Should I plug in? Yeah. Okay. So that's HTML two. Correct. Okay. So this cable is for. Okay. I think this will probably be the easiest solution. Um, on the other, so if you switch to HTML1, it will give you instructions. Oh, okay. right. This is just usually the easiest. Okay. Uh, it's just quick and simple. You just yes. have to plug it in. Yeah. I do apologize for. That's okay. okay. Everything should be running. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. And I think because you said you wanted it handwritten. Yeah, I prefer it handwritten. Okay. Here. Um, I don't want you to just cut and paste. Okay, so if you go into um, Results. Uh, so if we go down here to the bottom where we go to the different pages. So this is page one, where we first switch to the year. So then we just pick like four or seven or whatever and pick something from here and, and tell me about that. Okay? Do two, two sentences in your own words. A complete sentence. Yeah. And this is the next class in person? Uh, yeah. I believe that's when or the other one too. Seventeenth. Seventeenth. Okay. So you have a couple. Yeah. And the other reason I do this assignment is that I want you to be thinking about what you might do your uh, research paper on, and this is a way to get. Uh, into the literature a bit, or into other resources, and, and learn, you know, something about those three topics, uh, so that maybe you'll, you know, find it easier to, to uh, develop your research. So, uh, and in the meantime, if you have any questions about possible topics, of course, uh, just let me know, and I'm happy to chat with you about that. Okay. So that's okay. We got that. Um, so today we're going to move on to
into that feeling. So, um, so the first part of this course is to introduce you to the four basic tissues. You will be asked this again. And these four basic tissues um, include epithelia. So epithelia includes, that's the plural form of the word, um, and uh, these are sheets of cells, as we'll see, that cover surfaces of the body. They may be derived from the embryonic germ cell layers of either ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm. Uh, in our, uh, so, uh, they are held together connected to the rest of the body with the connective tissue. Connective tissue comes from the mesoderm of the embryonic germ cell. Oh, there it is. And we have both embryonic connective tissue as well as adult connective tissue. In the adult connective tissue, we have what is termed proper connective tissue as well as specialized. The specialized types include cartilage, bone, and blood. Okay. Yes. So what do you mean by proper? Well, that's just what they called it. <laughs> so, so again, connective tissue, as we'll see when we get there, which is not going to be this week, um, but that, that it's a uh, tissue um, composed of uh, fibroblasts that um, produce uh, collagen, um, elastic fibers, uh, particular fibers that um, attach, the, the epithelia are attached to and that also attach cells to one another. So they let these molecules in and then they end up forming these attachments and connecting everything together. Um, so, that's basically what proper connective tissue is, or the general term of connective tissue. Specialized, of course, our, our cartilage is a firm um, tissue that does not have any blood vessels in it. Uh, our bone is a mineralized connective tissue that does have blood vessels in it. And of course, both of these uh, help to form um, and provide support um, for uh, our bodies, essentially, allowing us to move and, and do other things. And then we have the blood um, that um, has specialized cells in a, in a, in a fluid uh, rather than a more firm uh, or, or, or soft matrix. Uh, but we'll, we'll go over that as we go okay? Uh, then we have muscle. These are uh, cells that are derived from mesoderm, and they get put together uh, in various arrangements. But the key feature of those is that they are contractile, that they have uh, filaments within them that can slide past one another um, and um, enable us to move, of course, or perform movements of various things through our bodies. And then we have our nervous tissue. This is derived only from ectoderm. Um, and um, of course, that's mainly our neurons and, and their arrangements into the various structures in the body, including ganglion and brains. Finally, we have um, these definitions you should know. So when we're looking at any um, um, organ, um, we have basically a parenchyma. These are those functionally specialized cells present in it. And they can be a mixture of different cell types. 
And then the stroma is the supporting or also known as connective tissue. So uh, connective tissue uh, wraps around our muscle cells as well and then connects it to the epithelia and, uh, and nervous tissue. Not so much connective tissue in the nervous system, of course, but, but it does help hold it together. And so organs and organ systems have a common function. And that's what we'll be looking at after we get through the basic tissues. So what happens in your cell is that we have the synthesis and breakdown of molecules, the proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, uh, nucleic acids, like the lower blood protein, amino acids, you know, and other things. But um, that's what's happening throughout our cells at the moment. And what we see as a structure when we're looking at them under the microscope is the molecules that are present in the particular arrangement providing a snapshot of cell function at the time that we throw it into the pixel. This is a uh, kind of basic diagram. Uh, a uh, line years ago, uh, but it shows you, it tries to show you a kind of three-dimensional aspect here to the cell. The largest organelle in our cells, of course, is the nucleus, uh, a eukaryotic cell, is the nucleus, um, and um, that we have um, the, uh, uh, then on the outside we have our rough endoplasmic reticulum, we have the Golgi, we have mitochondria, we have uh, our filaments, intermediate filaments, um, and things, and then our centrioles to help guide cell division. The apical surfaces of cells can be put, uh, can have these specializations on them, as we see, particularly for the epithelia. And so, as I go through um, each of these special tissues, um, we're going to give you some definitions and key features. And we'll look at examples. So here's our definitions for epithelium, plural or epithelia. One or more layers of cells arranged in a sheet or invaginated that's pressed into the underlying connective tissue to form glands. A gland is an organized aggregation of cells that function as a secretory or excretory organ. These that cells and an epithelium are contiguous, that means adjacent to one another, and they become tightly bound to one another with junctional complexes, different types of junctions. These epithelial cells rest on a layer of connective tissue and are attached to it. They synthesize two layers, or some debate now about whether it's two or one of the basement membrane, as we'll see, which is that little, you know, hard to see membrane um, at the junction of the epithelial cell and the connective tissue. There are no blood vessels running within the epithelium. They all run into, through the connective tissue underneath it, and then you get your nutrients and oxygen uh, diffusing the connective tissue um, to provide uh, those compounds to the epithelial cells themselves. And this is also why uh, epithelia can only be so many layers thick uh, because of the aspect of the, the nutrients and gases having to diffuse um, up and be passed along only a certain distance really works well. 
Epithelial tissue is named based on the number of cell layers and the morphology of the outer surface. Um, you know, outside covering the body or um, coating the lumen of uh, our gastrointestinal tract is uh, has lumen space from the tube through the tube there, um, and that is uh, where we will find them. And they'll have different shapes. So, all histology books have some sort of um, uh, illustrations like these. Um, point out how the epithelia are classified. First, they can be classified as either simple or stratified. Then simple means there's a single layer of cells resting on the basement membrane, which is shown here by this uh, um, feature that has little lines drawn through it to represent like collagen fibers. The stratified uh, epithelia have multiple layers of cells, um, only one layer of which attaches to the base of the membrane. And then there's this outer surface. Layer. By shapes, what we have are squamous or squamous, depending on where you uh, come from or whatever, but uh, these are flattened cells, uh, compressed. You may see a little bulge where the nucleus is in the cell. These are uh, the most examples of these, which is the blood vessel lining. Cuboidal, the nuclei are in the middle of the cells, kind of uniform um, uh, cytoplasm covering around them. Columnar cells, they are taller than they are wide. And the nuclei of these columnar cells may be placed either along the base of the cells next to the connective tissue, or uh, in the middle, or closer to the apical surface. Columnar cells may vary um, and have you know, cilia on them, or microvilli, or something that's missing. And finally, we get this pseudostratified situation in which there's a single layer of cells, but all of the cells will be touching the basement membrane, but not all of them will reach the surface. So we do have uh, cells that are short, stuck in here, um, then we have these taller cells, they may be secreting um, mucus or enzymes or something in vesicles. Um, the nuclei of, the, of those cells, as you can see, is way up here. Nuclei of other cells are spaced differently down here. And so if you look just at the nuclei, you think you had stratified layer, but it's really a simple bacteria. So it's pseudo-stratified. Then we have our stratified um, cells. Uh, the squamous non-keratinized. So this means that it's a moist covering surface. But it's stratified to have multiple layers here so that it provides very tough um, and strong um, coverings where you need them. And this is uh, what we find um, in our uh, mouse um, and uh, the lower uh, uh, digestive tract. The keratinized provides a uh, surface where the outermost layer of cells has died, um, nuclei are no longer present, and the cells just dry into these flakes, which as we all know, slough off our skin. Um, and every day we shed millions of these things um, all over the place. So, uh, so again, this is going to be on the outside, dry surfaces, non keratinized is covering wet surface on the interior of the body. And then we have special ones. Uh,
stratified cuboidal uh, we find in the um, uh, sweat glands, uh, in the ducts of sweat glands. We have this uh, stratified columnar, uh, we can see in places. And then we have the special uh, transitional epithelium. Transitional um, is recognized because when the organ is relaxed, uh, the outermost surface of cells bulges up, becomes rounded. But when it's stretched out, it's distended, and they flatten down and form a really nice waterproof layer. So the transitional epithelium is found lining our bladders, our urinary bladders, as well as the ureters that lead from the kidneys down to the bladder, um, and a little bit um, of the uh, urethra, uh, depending on where you are. Question. So, like we've been talking about nurses who hold their hand for a very long time, over time, can their cells become more distended and be like less likely to return back to a relaxed state? Uh, could be. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, yeah. like they hold it in so long, I was wondering if it could change over time. Well, it could. Uh, of course, um, the ability of cells to contract and relax uh, depends on many factors. Uh, but age, of course, uh, the older you get and the more stretched out it is, it's not as likely to recover. That's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not in that way from the situation of a nurse, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so these epithelial cell properties, important to remember. Uh, on the free surface of the cell, this apical surface, um, you may have microvilli, which are um, uh, little waves. Uh, they form along the surface. They're supported by filaments, uh, uh, collagenous filaments inside. Um, and they increase surface area. They increase the surface area of the cell, um, allowing for more absorption of molecules through that, that um, uh, cell membrane there, uh, or excretion of, of uh, or secretion of compounds. Um, stereocilia, although they had the term cilia, it turns out they are a branching uh, type of microvilli that, you know, come out and you might see out the uh, And they're found in a couple of places in the body, um, particular uh, cells as we'll see. Cilia are these um, micro uh, tubules that uh, get arranged in a particular way. Uh, they are able to beat. Um, they have uh, motion, uh, and they can then uh, move uh, mucus, for example, along the surface of the, of the epithelium uh, to get rid of particulate matter. Now, the cell membrane, uh, as we've reviewed, is made up of phospholipids, and the Lipids wash out during our cell processing um, to get uh, water out of the cells and then to get paraffin in the cells. But what we do see um, that can be stained are these uh, proteins and carbohydrates, the attached carbohydrates, that are embedded within the um, um, lipid bilayer membrane. So you have these, you know, the raft of, of things in the, the membrane um, of these other molecules in there. And uh, that is what is termed the glycocalyx. So it can be stained, um, and then you may see, depending, of course, on the uh, different compounds present within it. And this is also where regulated secretory products will be released. That means that there is usually a, a signal coming to the cell, a uh, signal molecule that has to uh, interact with the receptor, 
uh, and then tell the cell to send out uh, particular secretions. So on the sides of the epithelial cells, um, lateral and basolateral, um, is where we'll find more of these junctions holding all the cells together. So you gotta remember in a three-dimensional world um, that the cell is coming out of the plane here and going behind the plane of the screen as well. And um, we have at the um, very top of these cells what is termed an occluding junction. Uh, the occluding junction binds those cells together very tightly right at um, this um, interface with with the free surface. So it's going to prevent anything from going in between the cells. Okay. Um, we also have adhering junctions. We have the zonular adherens, uh, which may be a band of, of these interlinking molecules that extends around the entire surface, uh, of the apical surface. And then we have these little macular adherens, which are also known as desmosomes, and they are present, scattered over uh, the cell membrane surface and attaching to the adjacent cells. So we we'll talk about them as being like spot welding to hold everything together. And then finally, we may have these gap junctions where um, the cell membranes of two adjacent cells are very close together so molecules can traverse easily between the, the cell membranes through uh, pores or through uh, absorption and that sort of thing. I hope it's still alive. <laughs> I'm the first one. I see, okay. Um, anyway. So you have all of those. And then you may have, as we will find in the liver, when we talk about it later, that the membranes between two cells may be uh, uh, expanded a bit, and they form a little canal there. Um, and in the case of our liver cells, those canals fill with bile that is secreted out of the liver cell, uh, gathers in there, and then flows down to bile duct. Now, most importantly, along the basal side, where it's connecting to the connective tissue, uh, we have what is termed, um, again, the basement membrane, but the basal or basement lamina is the layer that is produced by the epithelial cell. So these are molecules that they produce that are able to attach the um, base of the epithelial cell to molecules in the um, uh, layer of the connective tissue adjacent to it. And then there's also these important structures, hemidesmosomes or half desmosomes, that send out these anchoring filaments as well. So we'll go over that a little bit more. Um, so here's some examples. So here we have connective tissue, and this is a, a section through a blood vessel, um, which when you blow it up this way, it's really pixelated, I guess. But anyway, uh, what we're looking at here um, are the nuclei that are staining purple, purple blue. The dye that does this in our routine histological stains is called hematoxylum. Is the emphasis that I'm giving that? You need to know that, and I want you to know that by the end of the semester. I find too many students don't remember. The hematoxylum is one of the dyes we'll be using to stain the tissue. And then you can see that the cytoplasm extending out um, uh, along here in the squamous cells, stains pink. And the pink is stained by the dye called eosin that binds to uh, protein, positive <coughs> intelligent cells. Eosin, E O S I N. 
So it's it's um, it's pink. It's stating protein. I'm going to talk to them stain tissues. The nuclei. Nuclei. Stain tissues. This is what is referred to as a routine stain. Um, we have also special stains using lots of different dyes um, procedures that may give different components of cells uh, different colors. Um, but you need to remember that you're not looking just at differences in colors, but you also want to look for differences in structures, you know, shapes, um, how they connect to one another, uh, uh, size or, or amount of cytoplasm in relation to the nucleus, and that sort of thing. And so we have a capillary here that is lined by the squamous layer cells called endothelium. Um, and the bulges of the nuclei are apparent here. And then in the lumen, we have red blood cells primarily passing along here. The red blood cells, as you'll see, are erythrocytes from their mature black nuclei. So they are the cells in, in uh, the vertebrates that lack, lack nuclei. Now, not all vertebrates, because uh, amphibians, reptiles, and fishes do have nucleated red blood cells. Uh, and here's a nice cross section where you see your erythrocyte in there. Here's your nucleus, the cytoplasm is wrapping around, forming that cap. Okay. Now, <clears throat> along these capillaries, there's another specialized cell type people finally realize. So it's located slightly on the outside of the endothelial cells. These are called parasites. And um, one of the tools that I'm giving you in the lab part of the thing is a word root list that shows um, the Latin and Greek um, uh, prefixes and roots and suffixes for most of our biological terms, how they just were derived. So you think about perimeter around the outside. So we have pericyte around the outside of the cell. Um, so that's what's going on here. The cell is on the outside of the uh, epithelium there. Now we go to the other extreme, and we had stratified squamous keratinized uh, epithelium on the skin. Um, different regions have been recognized based on their histological features. Um, so when we go in to study integument of the skin, we will find, um, we will learn all about these layers and that sort of thing. Um, but basically, uh, the, the uh, uh, layer of cells that connects to the connective tissue um, are the cells that are still capable of dividing. Then those cells keep moving up and getting pushed out as more cells divide and produce new ones. And then they start to undergo this process where they lose the nuclei. And we have uh, a layer here uh, uh, where those nuclei are breaking down and there's a change in synthesis to be producing more keratin filaments. And then that's on the other side, that's all we'll see are these, you know, leftover squames or, or packets of, of uh, uh, just the, the cell body. Um, and those keratin filaments in it. It's all the stuff stuff off. Desmosomes can often be, um, well, appear between these cells in what is termed the prickle cell layer. And so um, uh, I will I remember to get out uh, eventually when we're talking about the epithelium. Tomorrow we're not going to do, uh, we're going to do some abbreviated exercises. But then when we get to the worksheet on the epithelium, um, I have some dog uh, paw slides, and you can pick these areas out where what actually has happened with these um, uh, keratinocytes, uh, as we call them here, is they send out little extensions, and the little extensions um, interlap or overlap with one another, and then in between them, there are all these desmosomes holding everything together. So this is why we get a nice, tough layer on the surface of 
to protect our lives. Okay. And basement membrane, again, is going to be what's down here, connecting the epithelium to the connective tissue. Another example, uh, these are uh, cells, they are uh, prepared uh, uh, by uh, embedding the sample into a plastic, which can then be sectioned uh, with a glass or diamond knife and made into a thinner section. The thinner you make your section, the fewer cell layers you have to look through that may be laying on top of one another. So plastic sections are really nice to be able to see all the features clearly. Um, and um, in this case, we have these lateral membranes uh, can be uh, clearly seen because of proteins in them, um, as we find also on the surface here, the glycocalyx. Um, and then on this surface, this would be the base of the membrane attaching to connective tissue underneath here. We have a nucleus, and the nucleus showing clearly in some of the cells. Uh, but what's happened here? There. Well, they probably still have a nucleus. But as you will see, and as we'll explore in lab tomorrow, if you make a section through a cell such as here, you're not going to see that nucleus. So if everything else looks all right with the cell in relation to its neighbors, it probably has a nucleus somewhere, it just wasn't in that plane of section that you were able to cut. Uh, can anybody um, tell me what you think that might be? Part of the nucleus, right? You skimmed along the surface of the nucleus, the nuclear membrane. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that you have to start thinking about. Um, converting what we see on a two-dimensional image into what might have been a three-dimensional structure. What are we missing? Um, now, the lamina reticularis, as we said, the basement membrane, they make this the basal lamina. And originally, um, people said there was a, a clear, very pale area of, of molecules and then there was a dense area of molecules. But now people are thinking maybe the pale area was an artifact of the uh, processing of that uh, tissue. Uh, maybe it's just one layer of molecules that interacts and, and is attached to this lamina reticularis, which has reticular fibers in it inside the connective tissue. Both of those together are the basement member. Where the connection between the epithelium and connective tissue. Uh, here's an example uh, again, a plastic section from urinary bladder that's been relaxed. So, again, the surface layer is bulging out here, as you can see. Um, we have our nucleus, nucleolus present in some of the cells, but not all of them. Um, this is where our basement membrane will be. And then we get down into here, and we are seeing um, the connective tissue. So here we'll find fibroblasts and, and uh, fibers being produced. And we'll look at that in more detail. So these are a couple of interesting um, epithelia that I found as, uh, doing. Uh, slide reading for the PLAM surveys that uh, Maryland Department of Natural Resources um, uh, conducts uh, in the summers. Uh, and this one was uh, from a razor plant. This is uh, in their digest lining their digestive system. A very nice, simple epithelium here, uh, columnar epithelium. But boy, they sure had really long cilia on those cells for some reason. Um, and the darker pink staining here is where those cilia, those microtubules, uh, are anchored along that apical surface by other uh, filaments within the cytoplasm. And then on this uh, thing underneath here, this was part of their stomach, the gastric shield, 
Uh, again, there's a fairly simple formula of helium going on there. You know, the connective tissue and, and uh, blood uh, hemal sinus, as they say. And on this side, we have um, an epithelium that contains the mucous secretory cells and ciliated cells, which is essentially like what we have lying in our trachea. So you can see that cilia, uh, I mean, the epithelia can have uh, diverse um, uh, cell types within it, or they can just be very simple. A few more examples. Um, we're going to look at esophagus and trachea. Unfortunately, I only have one two of these slides left. We're going to show them side by side. Um, the esophagus uh, is lined by our stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium, so this is kept moist. Um, and uh, then on our trachea, we have our pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. As you can see up here, they're again in the plastic section along the surface. Uh, the mucus secreting cells don't show up quite so well. They are scattered uh, in there. And here's an example of uh, our glands. Invaginated, so they've been pressed into the connective tissue, and then the epithelia lining those glands has um, become modified into cell types that produce various secretions, such as mucus, um, as you can see here, or in other cases, uh, more watery secretion. This is um, a um, plastic <coughs> section through uh, the epithelium along uh, the villi of uh, uh, duodenum, or duodenum, you want to pronounce that. Um, the nuclei of the cells here that are the columnar cells with microvilli on the surfaces, which is this little brush border, as it's also called, um, that um, you know are roughly about the same, uh, showing the same uh, position within these columnar cells. We have a terminal web, again, of, of uh, additional um, filaments within the cells that, that help to provide support to the microvilli and push the membrane uh, out there. Um, and then we have our basal membrane here. It's very thin, hard to see, this membrane. Um, and then underneath here is connective tissue. And then we have a variety of cells that infiltrate the connective tissue from our, from our uh, blood vessels uh, to help provide uh, protection, uh, immune responses, uh, and that sort of thing. Now some of those cells, which are the ones known as lymphocytes, can also migrate up between the membranes, the cell membranes, of those epithelial cells. And so they uh, form their way up between, as you can see, they have a little slightly different nucleus, it's a little rounder, and you can see like a little halo around them. Uh, that's the cytoplasm of a lymphocyte. Um, and so they get up there, push the, push the columnar cell membranes out of, out of position, and show up there so that, you know, if bacteria are trying to get in, they're there, they're ready. They're going to do something against those bacteria or virus. Okay, another thing um, to be aware of as you're reading slides is that you may come across uh, what we term mitotic fingers or cells that are undergoing mitosis. And you should be able to remember the different stages of mitosis. Everybody know what P stands for? So that you you know a nice metaphase plate, one where the chromosomes have lined up, one with a little solid little band in there. 
This is an example uh, from the clam uh, uh, sinus showing some cell division. And then um, this is another example of uh, uh, these uh, hemocytes that they call them in the clams. Now, as I was telling you, um, the nuclei stain generally blue through purple with the hematoxin because they contain in them DNA. And so the chromosomes should be staining blue with the DNA. However, there's something unusual that I discovered in the clam intestine today. Um, Anybody tell me what's going on in this cell? Right. This is a cell, it's got cytoplasm, and it has a red nucleus, a pink, a pink to red nucleus. Why? <laughs> well, I started calling this rosy cell unknown. And our current hypothesis is that it is a maybe an amoeba, because I got uh, you know different batches of clams and started noticing that these were migrating in between the gill epithelial cells to get into their um, uh, hemolymph sinuses um, and vessels, and then in some of the some of these baby clams, it was like they were. Blooming with other parasites and bringing up nutrients from them. I think they may have been contributing to the mortality of clams today. Still need somebody to study that. If anybody is interested in that, which you do now, we have equipment that you can um, take out. It's called laser capture micro dissection. So you can look at a slide and pluck out cells from the slide um, and then uh, extract DNA from them and sequence them. And that's all we need to do here. <laughs> but I don't know those techniques. So I don't know if any of you are interested in that. Mm -hmm. Well, I call them rosy cell unknown. I mean, the uh, technique. Oh, the technique is Sorry. laser, L O S E R, capture, micro dissection. So it's essentially a microscope with a special laser on it that will allow you to lift um, cells off the slide. Uh, so that you can um, uh, put them into a tube, they'll be on the, the surface of the cap of the tube, and then you can extract proteins or, or DNA or, or RNA out of them and analyze it. That's the tubes. Uh, here is um, a human prostate. So the prostate gland is interesting because it has like a, a um, lumbar surface layer of cells and then a basal layer underneath it. That basal layer, turns out, uh, is producing a high molecular weight keratin. And by producing an antibody to that protein, uh, people were and putting a, a, a coloring cell, uh, molecule attaching to it. Uh, they are able to see exactly where that basal layer is and note that the, the uh, surface layer does not uh, stain that way. Uh, so, so that's another uh, interesting thing. This is an example of immunohistochemistry. So we have here um, these variety of cell types that can be found uh, in our uh, duodenum, which includes not only epithelial cells that cover the surface, remember they're gonna have the apical specialization known as microvilli, but they're also in this part of the small intestine invaginations of cells, um, so I hear the crypts of Lieberkuhn, these deep uh, invaginations between the villi, but then we get further invaginations, and the cells become modified to produce tons of mucus. And these are called the glands of Bruma. You see the mucus there. When 
I ask you to find endothelial cells. Remember that you're going to be looking for those lining blood and lymph vessels throughout the connective tissue, in the muscles, uh, in the heart. The heart not only that is, is the organ that rolls blood and everything. And it's lined by endothelium, but it also has lots of blood vessels running through it to provide those cardiac muscles with nutrients and uh, oxygen. And uh, then we have layers on the out, we have connective tissue uh, surrounding each, uh, each of the, the epithelial cell and the basal part of the epithelial cells and glands. Um, we have a, a submucosal layer. We have then our um, smooth muscle cells on the outside that will contract and help move uh, food along uh, the intestinal tract. And finally, on the outside, we have another layer of squamous cells, and that's called the mesothelium. Um, and this layer um, is very important. It's a uh, moist layer, so you really no fluid on the outside of it, uh, but it helps to hold you know, the various spectrum elements together. Uh, it's called the serosa, again, because it's, it's the watery um, solution, the watery um, um, secretions, uh, keeping it moist. Whereas on this side, we have mucosa because we're going to have a lot of mucus secreting cells here um, within the uh, epithelium covering the book. And this little uh, slide uh, tells you that we have uh, lots of different shapes for glands. They can be simple tubular glands. They can be a tube that comes down and gets all wound around and around, um, as we will find in our sweat glands. Um, they can also branch simply or more complicated or way more complicated. Um, and then we also have glands that will have clusters of cells uh, at the ends of ducts. Um, and uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, and in some cases, it's just amazing to me how they ever figured out the structures of uh, some of uh, the glands in our body and other important organs and how they, they operate. Yeah. How can a gland be unicellular? Give me an example. An example of a unicellular gland is the mucus uh, secreting cell. Um, so we, uh, I guess the first ones they really describe they refer to them as goblet cells, and I'll see those in the uh, intestinal tract. But we also have them um, uh, in the respiratory uh, tract, we have them in the um, uh, so we have other mucus secreting cells in the uh, stomach uh, epithelium. Uh, Glands there uh, and uh, other places. So they don't, they're not all exactly goblet cells in the shape of a wine goblet, which is how that got to have its name. Uh, but uh, uh, right. so here's um, a uh, example. Uh, again, You'll see when we get to the skin, we have our sweat glands that can be quite um, uh, coiled in this secretory portion. And then they say I have a duct that goes up to the surface in the case of these apron sweat glands or abacrine that connect to hair shafts. What would be the purpose of them being all wound up like that? Well, what do you think? Store store. Store. So yeah, it, it's compressed into a smaller space rather than running all over the, you know, through the connective tissue. And also by by being coiled up like that, um, that it can, you know, um, you've got all your secretions going on in a smaller area and then they can all come to bear on the whole side. So We'll also see in our livers. Again, liver is the largest gland in the body, um, and uh, uh, 
use lots of stuff, uh, and how that's arranged. Uh, so there's two types of products generally that our glands produce. So we have mucus, uh, mucopolysaccharide, uh, and then serous, which means a watery solution. A watery molecule, so and we have three modes of secretion. Merocrine means that the secretory product of the cell um, is going to just be released through the um, plasmonella. Holocrine means that the whole cell dies and is secreted. Uh, the, the substances within it are released as it lyses. And a good example of that are the sebaceous glands, um, as we'll see when we study those in more detail, um, because that, that uh, ebon, the lymph ligand, um, gets pushed on the ego shafts. And then finally, the apocrine secretion is where um, the uh, secretory product is in a um, membrane bound, uh, or it's going out, and that fuses. Uh, or, or that whole uh, thing is released out of the um, surface there. And you see little round blobs of, of material in the lumen uh, in uh, the secretory products. So while we're um, finishing up here in the last five minutes, I want you to think about um, what we've talked about today and start getting your mind to thinking about, okay, what do I need to look at here to recognize different features of cells? Um, and so I'm showing you here two epithelia, okay? Um, and you need to look at, well, is there one layer of cells or more than one layer of cells? Where are the nuclei placed within the cell. Is there more cytoplasm than nucleus? Um, here we have fairly distinct that we have two layers. This is a stratified cuboidal epithelium. This is also, although it's a little more difficult to make out here. Here we also have um, some small capillaries with endothelial cells lining them. Uh, uh, note also that the cytoplasm of these cells, besides being more cytoplasm than these versus the these, the, the uh, uh, amount of uh, or density of the pigmentation that says they were dyed is different means that they may have different uh, organelles within them or different amounts of organelles. They have more mitochondria versus less, uh, and that sort of thing. And finally, here's another um, uh, set of uh, sections for cells. So here, we have cells that have, apparently, the apical part of the cell is full of uh, small little clear, clear to foggy bits of material. Anybody think what these cells might be? Atlas? No, I mean, I know it, it, it looks clear, like an cell cytoplasm might be, but it's really got this kind of frothy secretion in it, which is mucus. So these are the goblet cells, and what we're looking at here are the bases. So your villi are coming up, and you cut across way deep down in here where you've got connective tissue surrounding the bases of these crypts of Lieberkuhn. Um, and that's, um, uh, so then we have um, the brush border cells that are coming in here. You can barely see a lumen. It'll expand a bit. The lumen will be wider if you're cutting up in a different plane, of course. And then here's connective tissue in between. Whereas on this side, um, what's going on in the cytoplasm of these cells? Can you make that out? See all the little pink dots? No. 
Now, so these little pink dots are uh, they're staying pink because they're full of proteins. What's an important protein type in the body, a category in the body? Uh, well, we have structural proteins and then we have what's the function of chemical act as something to transport um, signal no. What do we have? A lot of enzymes are dead. Yeah. Chemical reactions are driving chemical reactions and breaking things down and building things up. So these are actually full of enzymes. This is from the pancreas. And we have a semi or clusters of cells that surround the ends of ducts in the pancreas. And they are all busy producing. Um, the uh, enzymes, uh, especially the, I forgot what you can't remember, um, uh, Animals? no, uh, insulin, no, uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, chymotrypsin. So, yes, so they're, they're in little membrane bound vesicles, and that's why they appear in little pink dots there. Okay? So that's all I have for you today, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.